Hey, Joe, is it you or me? Okay, we, we usually wait about 20 seconds to see if any of the attendees come in. I don't see anyone. Okay, now we have an attendee. So I'll go ahead and start and go over some of the ground rules for tonight's hearing. Uh, my name is Joe Minert. I'm the City of Bowie Planning Director, and this is a virtual public hearing uh, with the Bowie Advisory Planning Board. Uh, this is a departure from parking and loading standards uh, request. And uh, the uh, next slide, please. The rules for participating are that uh, anyone who is interested in participating in the public hearing portion of the, of the meeting uh, should type the words wish to speak in the Q&A function. Uh, we do not recognize raised hands or uh, respond to any questions that are asked through the Q&A. Simply, the Q&A is used for uh, you to sign up to speak during the public hearing and the chairman will address that uh, and, and recognize you at that time. So uh, if there's any uh, opposition to the request tonight, uh, the whoever is speaking during the public hearing would also be offered the opportunity for rebuttal uh, after, the, after the applicant makes their final presentation. So at this point, uh, I just encourage you if you wanna participate in the public hearing to type the words wish to speak under the Q&A. And I'll turn the meeting over to Chairman Terry Rogers to begin the meeting. Okay, uh, thank you, Joe. And uh, good evening and welcome everybody. The hearing tonight will involve a presentation by city staff, followed by a presentation by the applicant. The um, uh, docket, the, what we'll be hearing is our planning board number 20-06, and it is a departure from design standards in this companion to case detail site plan DSP 19021 South Lake. Okay, board members will have an opportunity to ask questions of staff and the applicant following their presentations. The board will also have an opportunity to hear comments submitted by the public for the public hearing and any questions received during the hearing. Board members will be polled for their comments, if any, prior to a motion. All those wishing to speak, please state your name. And each person will state their name and all speakers will be asked to raise their right hand and respond, yes, or I do. And I will ask, do you swear or affirm that the statement you're about to give are to be are true to the best of your knowledge, information, or belief. So uh, at this time, Joe, do we have anyone signed up to speak, or do we do that at, uh, now? I turn it over to Frank. Either either one. Yes, turn it over to Frank, and at the public hearing portion, we'll call for the participation. Hey, Frank, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you for the record, Frank Stevens of the city planning staff. Here tonight to review with you um, BD-1-20, uh, departure from design standards. Uh, next slide, please, Anthony. The petitioner in this case is Carrington LLC, represented by Mr. Matthew Tedesco. The property is located on southbound uh, 301, as we can see in attachment uh, two to our report here. It's on the west side of 301, uh, about a half a mile south of the interchange with Central Avenue. The proposed use of the property is um, 900,656 square feet of retail, uh, office, commercial and hotel space on 59.83 acres, which are zoned EIA, employment and institutional area. On April 9th, we mailed out 118 letters advertising this hearing. And also on uh, April 9th, we posted the sign with uh, five, the property with five signs advertising this hearing. We'll just jump right into the report. Um, our comments are fairly brief. Um, uh, I'll just go through uh, the the uh, the, um, 
the report beginning on page two, uh, there were three attachments that are provided to our report. Attachment one is a statement of justification prepared by the applicant. The second uh, attachment is uh, a, the, the, uh, the display that's on the screen right now, a site plan of the property that's under review. And the third was a parking analysis memo dated February 16th. By way of informational background that's uh, provided in the, uh, in the statement of justification, there are several Maryland County uh, in, this, in this region that have adopted regulations requiring the dimensions of parking spaces that are similar to what's requested by this departure tonight. Secondly, the new Prince George's County Zoning Ordinance will require standard parking spaces to be nine feet by eight by 18 feet, which is the parking space size that's requested under this under this departure. And lastly, this, the city has granted in the past departures from the size of non-parallel, non-handicapped parking spaces. Uh, and we cite several examples in the report. There are four findings that need to be made by the board um, to grant a departure pursuant to section 27239.01B7A of the Prince George's County Zoning Ordinance. And those four findings are discussed uh, on pages two through eight of our report. We've concluded that all the findings have been satisfied and therefore we, uh, we uh, recommend approval of the departure as uh, noted on page eight of the report for 142 um, non-parallel, non-handicapped parking spaces with dimensions nine feet by 18 feet. That concludes the city presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Frank. Um, before we get into the presentation by the applicant, are there any uh, questions from the board of staff? Okay. Hearing none, who do we have presenting this evening for the applicant? Mr. Matt Tedesco. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, Matthew Tedesco here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, also with me this evening uh, from South Lake Partners LLC, we have Mr. Scott Rauch and Jamie Atkinson from Carrington LLC, uh, represented, represented tonight by Kevin Kennedy. And with Rogers Consulting, we have Mr. Nat Ballard. That makes up uh, our team of attendees this evening. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Board, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. As you all may recall, we were here two weeks ago um, for the detailed site plan associated with phase one for the commercial. And we, again, publicly thank you for your unanimous support uh, of that uh, detailed site plan that has not yet gone to the Planning Board. Uh, the City Council also unanimously supported uh, that recommendation uh, for support of that detailed site plan, which we're very appreciative of. Uh, before you this evening is a very narrowed uh, application that really falls within your jurisdiction, uh, and that is a departure from design standards for 142 of the 2015 parking spaces associated with phase one commercial. And what we've asked for that this body has and the city has approved um, uh, approximately eight different times, and I think that's spelled out quite well in Mr. Stevenson's report, uh, various projects in the city, uh, is a departure from design standards for 142 spaces to allow those spaces in particular to be nine by 18, nine feet by 18 feet, uh, instead of the re currently required nine and a half by 19. That's about a 10.2% reduction. Uh, as Mr. Stevens indicated uh, in his presentation, and as well as in his staff report, uh, which is reflected in our justification statement. Uh, there are six neighboring jurisdictions for that have parking space dimension requirements that are either consistent with or even smaller than what's proposed for 142 of the 2000 spaces. Those are Montgomery County, Calvert County, Charles, Anne Arundel, Frederick and St. Mary's. Also, it's worth repeating that the a new zoning ordinance for Prince George's County that's been adopted but not yet effectuated because we're waiting for the countywide map amendment to be adopted. But once that occurs, the new zoning ordinance uh, standard for, for non-parallel parking spaces is the nine by 18, which is proposed uh, here this evening. 
So there's a, a tremendous amount of consistency with what this application seeks um, for 142 of the 2000 spark parking spaces to be nine by 18. Um, you all may recall that uh, two weeks ago also you, you reviewed a similar departure associated with the multifamily. There was two departures associated with that, but one of them that this board unanimously supported dealt with the same uh, request, which was a reduction to the dimensional sizes of the parking. So for all the reasons provided in Mr. Stevens' report, which we agree with 100% uh, with his findings and conclusions, as well as uh, further incorporated in adopting our justification statement here this evening, uh, we would respectfully request this board's approval of the requested uh, departure BD-1-20 uh, to allow 142 parking spaces to be dimensioned at nine by 18. And with that, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, we'll be mindful of everyone's time and um, look, look for your support. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Tedesco, thank you very much. Um, let's jump right on into it. Um, from the board, do we have any uh, questions? Any questions? Let's start with Ms. Avery. Do you have any questions? No, Mr. Chair, I do not. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, going around the horn here, Mr. Bird. No, sir, Mr. Chair, I'm good. Okay, uh, Mr. Scotes. Mr. Scotes, you're on mute. Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I have, I have no problems with it. Okay, and the chair has no questions. So with that, uh, Mr. Tedesco, I want to uh, thank you for the presentation. And Joe, is there anyone signed up to speak? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, no one has signed up to speak. Okay, no one has signed up to speak. No questions have come in. And so with that, I guess um, the next thing is for us to just uh, entertain a motion. Uh, someone will make a motion, right? Don't be shy, guys. Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, this is Mike Bird. Thank you, Mr. Bird. All right. Yes, sir. Um, I recommend, I, I would like to, to pass a motion for approval of BD-1-20 to allow the departure from design specifications for 142 spaces at uh, nine feet by 18 feet in accordance with the new soon forthcoming uh, county ordinance 27239.01.B, B as in Bravo, 7 Alpha, as this departure is uh, falls in compliance with the recommendations um, by the city staff as well as justification from the applicant in the uh, four, oh, I'm sorry, the 14, <laughs> the 14 preceding uh, criteria for approval of the application. Mr. Chair, I'll second that motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Burden. Thank you, Mr. Scotes for the second. Are we ready for the question? All in favor of Mr. Bird's motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 The chair votes aye, and the motion carries. So uh, to the applicant, I want to thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for coming in. For anybody in the public that has participated or just sat in and listened to this hearing, uh, we want to express our thanks for your, uh, your time uh, spent with us this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the board. And thank you again, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Monarch for your review of this case. Um, you all have a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank okay. you all. Thank, thank you. All. Take care. Okay. All right, Joe, uh, I did not print out my agenda. And so can you tell me what's next on the agenda? 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is, um, I can introduce this item. This is a presentation being made by Mr. John Eidsness. Mr. Eidsness is with the uh, city's information technology committee. Um, so he had provided some testimony at the previous hearing that you had at your last meeting on South Lake on two of the items that were on the agenda uh, concerning the, the digital divide and the dig once policy. So uh, we want to hear from Mr. Eidsness and, um, you know, hopefully continue that cooperation with the IT committee. So at this point, I guess I can turn it over to Mr. Eidsness to uh, go ahead and make a presentation. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, and thank you, Board. Um, I wanted to put some context around the recent resolutions of the council that we work with them with on the uh, digital divide and tie it in with other activity ordinances and resolutions having to do with the, the, the city's dig once plan, as well as the city's uh, small wireless antenna site development and offered up as a consideration for as the committee goes forward for new developments uh, or uh, expansions of movies such as at Melford or Sears or other locations. Uh, we uh, we had a moment to uh, provide some discussion about dig once uh, for South Lake. Uh, it is city policy to use uh, single trenching for any new cuts in rights of way. Um, is it possible for me to have to share the screen, uh, Anthony? Yes, you can. All right. Uh, it still says disabled. So we'll take a pause while my PowerPoint and Zoom catch up. Still, uh, all right. Still says disabled. There we go. Thank you. I'm John Isis. I'm the vice chair for the uh, city council's uh, information technology committee. And before we go, I want to talk to you a little bit about the construction of uh, the committee and the membership. Uh, the members of this committee, every one of them has experience with uh, designing, implementing, or managing information technology systems for enterprises at the regional, national, and international level. Um, I myself, uh, the fe uh, former uh, federal program executive for a telecommunications company, and I've been working in IT since 1971, both for radio and fiber optics and copper. And we brought a lot of our experience uh, uh, and offered it to the city of Bowie and found that the city council has been very receptive. Uh, also the management of the city itself in terms of uh, uh, suggestions on how the city itself might operate. Our uh, council liaison is Rosanne, Roseanne Endibumadu and she's the one that introduced the latest resolution on uh, the digital divide. The ordinances that we're talking about are the dig once guidelines that uh, the city development plan, specifically the economic prosperity section addressing smart technology, the recent smart technology resolution uh, R921, which discussed the council's intent to pursue smart technology solutions that are appropriate for residents as well as for city operations and to address the digital divide. So sometime back in 2019, the city of Bowie also developed a small wireless facility design guidelines. All of these tie into uh, a, a vision, if that's the right word for the city of Bowie. Uh, I will tell you this, COVID year has been a test. It's been like living in a science fiction novel that was written in the 1960s without the flying cars. Everybody's connected. Uh, everybody has to work from home. Everybody, we've done everything but put little implants. But the tragedy is, and I'm gonna to refer to some statistics from 2018, 
where at one point in 2018, 36% of the population of Prince George's County, greater or lesser extent in Bowie, did not have access to broadband. So the year, almost a year and a half, that's had all of us working out of our homes, those of us who can, there's a large population, some within the city of the Bowie throughout the county that haven't been able to be as effective as we would wish they would be. And we we see all of this activity with the council and the city management as a guide, if you will, not just to catching up with where we're supposed to be, but to be prepared for future technology and future changes to make sure that we have not made decisions that lock people out of something new. As uh, someone once said, uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. We want to make sure it's evenly distributed in Bowie. Dig once, as we talked about a little bit through with uh, the South Lake development last week, is in the application in the public right away, we cut one trench with spare conduits for future use. And this prevents first provider capture. This also needs to apply wherever applicable, either with influence or with regulation, on private development as well. And if you remember, the first public comment that came after we read our memo into it was a resident of Bowie who lives in an apartment who's, who asked the developers, will you have more than one internet provider for these new buildings? Because if you don't have competition between internet providers, you're stuck with whatever it is the first one in offers. Uh, I don't know how you work your how you work your internet service, but I've found that uh, being able to pick up the phone and say I'm thinking of changing from uh, my from you, your current my current carrier to somebody else. What can you do? Suddenly prices change. Suddenly services change. Suddenly speeds are increased on your internet. If you live in an apartment building with one carrier, the answer, and they know which apartment buildings have one carrier, the answer is, sorry, can't do anything for you. No access to competitive service is a digital divide. We talk toward the end of this presentation about small wireless facilities design. There is a lot of things that I believe Bowie would be competent to take care of that the FCC and other regulatory bodies have taken away to make certain that there is universal distribution of wireless facilities. But I still believe that there's a lot of influence, there's a lot of uh, attention that the city of Bowie can use as these, as these projects roll out because frankly, antennas don't have to be ugly. They don't have to be taken up the disturbing the right of way. They don't have to be cutting up the street and Bowie streets and buildings should retain their original character in as much as it is technically, legally possible and aesthetically possible. And I recognize that there's a very limited amount the city of Bowie can do, but it doesn't hurt to ask. As an old boss of mine used to say, dare to ask. And as we look forward on some of this activity that comes on, it may be appropriate for the staff and the board to ask what the, what the developer's plans are for future antennas, as well as future fiber optic distribution. Let me see if my little mouse here works I can show you what's going on. Here's a little bit about Dig It Once. It is pre-install spare paths for future technology. As you can see, as I hope, well, right here at the bottom, there's a conduit that's shared by one, two, three, six different carriers. You might be able to see on this the, uh, the silhouettes of, of multi-tenant buildings in the background. These, this is facilitated by the placement of multi-cell conduit. It costs about $8 a foot to trench in uh, conduit if everything is correct, if you don't run into rock, if you don't have to tear up concrete. By putting in multi-cell conduit, the first provider using one of these small conduits here, which can be anywhere from a half inch to a full inch, depending upon how they're originally placed. Each one of these could carry anywhere at the very minimum 12 fibers and can go all the way up to 128 different fibers. And each one of those spare cells can be available for 
in the case of this seven cell for an additional six providers with one cup per spare. Spare duct management is a common practice for telecommunication companies and has been adapted for private properties. And my example from, from real life, the city of Ocean City has done this all along the boardwalk so that there can be digital access up and down the boardwalk without tearing up the boardwalk every time a new cell phone carrier or a new data carrier wants to reach one of the businesses along the boardwalk. We can use the same, we can ask for the same type of capabilities in the developments that are coming to Bowie as well as in our public right away. In the background, you can see a building that's right across the street from uh, the new town center. And if you'll notice on the roof there, uh, by my count and my estimation, there are at least seven different carriers operating out of that roof with more than seven different technologies because tall buildings are very attractive for cellular antennas, small site antennas. Uh, some of those things are satellite antennas. Some of them are high-speed data microwave connections to other buildings. It, it goes on and on. I'm willing to bet that at the time this building's design was originally roofed, uh, reviewed and approved, the, the roof line was presented as clean. And since that time, because landlords depend on this income, these carriers have placed their antennas up there and distorted the roof line that they have. It also means as you look in this building, as you go down through the floors, each one of these tenants, each one of these tenants, each one of these offices may have a different carrier that they prefer to serve them. From personal experience in my professional life, I have known there were landlords that refused admission to the building for anyone other than the first tenant. That may be appropriate in a commercial environment, but it's certainly not something that we want to encourage in a residential environment where people need choices to manage how much they spend each month on uh, internet services. I think it's a legitimate question for any of us to ask is, how are you planning to accommodate antennas, antennas on your roof, particularly in multi-story buildings? To get to this building, everybody would have had to have dig through that parking lot they would have come into the building and then they would have had to go vertically as well. Roof lines, they can be ugly or they can maintain the original character. And I've got some pictures uh, that I'll just go over very briefly to illustrate what I'm talking about. This is not in Bowie. This particular place is not in Bowie. This is an older building built in the 20s and 30s. You can see that there's lots of architectural details. It's uh, three or four stories tall. Uh, you can see it's been renovated, but since it's been renovated uh, for making a, uh, a, I'll call it a marquee downtown area, uh, shopping area, uh, all of these antennas have come up. It doesn't necessarily, is a bad thing, but it certainly has ruined the original line and it does affect the original character of the street, of the streetscape. This is in Bowie and this is the, uh, the, building that the volunteer fire department has up on 450. Again, somebody had an architect design that particular trapezoidal roof. And as antennas were added, uh, the roof line was disrupted. Annapolis, and I hope you're able to see this, has addressed that situation. What you're seeing, or I hope you're able to see here on the right, is uh, a water tower that's in Annapolis. It has about as many antennas on top of it as on the uh, the buoy fire department there. But there is a screen, a fiberglass screen that was installed as these antennas were going up. It doesn't interfere with the signal. It doesn't interfere with uh, any weather related problems, but it does mask all those antennas from general view. When the question comes up, how are you planning to accommodate future antennas? It wouldn't be unreasonable to look for a solution such as this fiberglass screen. And here's another example from Bui. For a landlord and a company that managed to place structures on their roof and manage the roof line in such a way that it maintains the original character as it was reviewed and approved by various planning commissions and planning boards. This is California. And these are street 
installations that are using power poles and light poles that are provided either by the municipality or through the local power company. On the right, this is an example of an installation that was done in Oakland, California. You can see a man standing at the bottom of that pole to give you an idea of the scare there. That's a nightmare. That's just not caring at all. The city of Oakland, this, in addition to having all that equipment hanging off the pole like that, most of that equipment has some sort of cooling and power fan in it that's running all the time. San Francisco, on the other hand, made this adaptation for light fixtures that are very typical in most parts of uh, Bowie, that Cobra, that Cobra light head there. You can see at the top, right up here, is a small cell site antenna that does very little to interfere with the original streetscape with those original aluminum light poles and light fixtures right there. As we go forward with Bowie, I hope we have the opportunity to insist that these new structures, in addition to bringing the digital services that, are, that, are, that our residents need, are done in such a way that they don't interfere as this uh, tragic installation does in the city of Oakland, California. I hope you understand as the committee went through and discussed all this, these were the kind of issues that we had in mind for context. And I hope that it's something that uh, we can work together on in the future and we'll be happy to discuss with you and the staff at any time. Any questions? Uh, yes, it's Mike Bird. How do you do? Hey, how are you doing, sir? Hey, great presentation. Yeah. Um, if you could, Mr. Mr. Ednis, am I pronouncing that correctly? Ednis? It's I, it's Ednis, but I couldn't spell it or pronounce it till I was 18, so you're forgiven. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Please excuse that. That's quite um, all right. If you could, just in layman's terms, how would you how would you present the whole topic of digital divide? So, for example, if if you were just you know at uh, I don't know, Allen Pond at a, at a festival, you had a booth set up with digital divide as a big banner on the front of your booth, and folks walked up and would say to you, "Hey, sir, what is a digital divide in layman's terms?" First and foremost, and this is the one that catches most everybody's attention, that digital divide is I simply can't afford to spend $800 for a computer, another $200 for a wireless set. That's one issue. And frankly, that's a public policy issue that we need to address. And Prince George's County Schools addresses through the distribution of, uh, through the distribution of uh, various equipments. The, there's another aspect of digital divide which is, I'll be frank, uh, some people just don't know how to make it work. Okay. And, and that's an issue for uh, places in Bowie, like the senior center, like volunteer associations and things like that. But the last one, and this is, and most people think of this as a rural problem. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no cable capable of carrying data that goes out into rural areas. No fiber, no wireless, no wireless service that can do little more than send, that can send emails back and forth. You would not think that would be true in Bowie or places like Bowie. But the fact is within Bowie, there are places where there is no, there, there's only one carrier or there's no fiber optic connection and people have to deter, have to park in places like the library or the school to do what they need to do, or they get in their car and they drive to work. Uh, I think this uh, the solution of get in your car and drive to work is completely antithetical mm -hmm. to all the work that we're trying to do to control carbon dioxide, to control gas, uh, to uh, you know basically keep people off fifty. So the traditional ones are economics, but certainly geography and geology are secondary concerns. And I, again, I'm going to point to uh, the member of the public that spoke right after the memo was read, will you have more than one carrier to our apartment building? And if you don't have more than one carrier in your apartment building, you're at a disadvantage to people like myself who could switch from Verizon 
to Comcast if I chose to with a phone call. And that's just not available to everybody. We're asking that we find ways to make it available. Okay, so hey, that was, that was a great answer. Thank you very much. So that's, that's a good segue into my next question. This, this is my last question. So you, you talk about competition is good. And, and I, I believe in the free market myself. And I think most of the members on the, on the board do as well. Um, you brought up some good examples of some of the uh, three-story, four-story buildings that at on the roof line, the roof line was, was very, um, I would say crowded with a number of various different providers antenna, antenna, antenna excuse me. Yes. So if, if competition is good, a number of providers is good, how do we, um, as the advisory planning board and or some of the higher ups with, with, with public policy, the pu public policy makers and initiators, how do we preclude crowding our skylines with a number of antenna? Uh, I, you had that one example of the fiberglass, um, the fiberglass shielding, which, which looked pretty good it, it, from a, an aesthetic standpoint. Does that have any detriment to the capabilities of the antenna that are up there? I'll answer that simply. The material that that uh, shield is made of is no different than the radome that's on an airplane that uh, radar signals broadcast through. It's to a radio signal, it's as transparent as glass. Uh, what needs to be done is somebody's got to have uh, some hardware on that roof that holds that uh, fiberglass so it doesn't blow off in the wind. Yeah. Uh, and that's a consideration at the architectural plan, just as they're deciding, just as an architect is deciding how to attach uh, temporary cranes on a roof so that they can raise pianos up and down or whatever it is that you've seen them or the window washers up and down, some thought could be given to where would you mount those fiberglass panels? It's not to restrict the number of antennas, it's to mask their appearance. Uh, if you, uh, I didn't include any pictures of this, but it's not uncommon uh, for me to recognize uh, antennas that are actually, they're actually mounted below the roof line. They look like architectural details. They might be slightly, they might, they look essentially like a sconce on the outside of the building mm -hmm. and it doesn't interfere with the signal. Uh, but uh, like I say, some thought needs to be, uh, some thought needs to be given to it. I don't know outside of building codes or outside of zoning codes, which I admit are beyond the scope of the planning board and the council at this time, how you could force people to do this. Fine. But you certainly, we're certainly in a position to ask them how they plan to do this and how they, man, how they plan to maintain the appearance. Um, Annapolis has codes as a special design district, I'm sure I have the word wrong, but Annapolis insists on this. And, and you have to agree that if you've been downtown, uh, remember when people used to go downtown? If you've been in downtown Annapolis, uh, you've had, you certainly had good cell coverage. The buildings and there certainly had good cell coverage and, and, no, and everybody is replacing the brickwork and things like that. Let's start thinking about how can we think about Bowie having that same type of uh, care. That's what we're asking. Very good. Thank you, Mr. John. Oh, thank you. Okay, do you have any other, any other questions? No, not just a comment. Um, thank you for the presentation, sir. Um, You're welcome. In a former lifetime, I was responsible for communications and what you're saying. It really, if you're locked into one carrier, um, it's feasible to come in with another one. Yes. However, the cost of putting the infrastructure in, in many cases, is just doesn't doesn't two and two doesn't add four. Um, I agree with you that you know it's something to look forward to going forward uh, with the planning board and, and possibly the the council and mayor and your other committees. Uh, to start thinking ahead. Um, I like what you were saying as far as when you go in and you have to create communications, the fibers to get to a building or buildings, um, it makes more sense 
if you have multi options uh, like you were describing, then to put the one, the, the traditional one, one thing there, uh, because let's face it, um, you know, it, it would really be a challenge as we go forward with existing structures. Yes. Um, I think residential wise, <laughs> you might as well forget it because, uh, you know, for the benefits at this point, unless you're getting into newer subdivisions, um, would just be cost prohibitive. I mean, you know, you have somebody that's, you know, looking at $39 a month for their cable bill, but by the time you put the construction cost to get that, we're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I really like the presentation, John. Um, Thank you. Because I basically had to, on several occasions, um, to go through the hoops and bang my head against the wall because, like you said, um, if you have one carrier, then it's pretty much it's my way or the highway. It's a. Uh... You are, I would say, it's almost a monopoly power, oh, considering yeah. the, the cost of disk and reconnect is, is, is a huge burden to go over with. I'll point out that in some of those multi, those multi-cell ducts uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in my professional life, we've actually placed new fiber by just using air pressure to blow the new fiber through the tube. And... That's magic. Uh, I don't think it's always appropriate in, in, in a full outside installation like that. And I have known, uh, and I'll use the example of uh, some work that I was uh, familiar with in New York City, where uh, around Wall Street, where people are willing to pay a fortune to drill through concrete on every floor oh, to get yeah. faster and faster fiber optics, it got to the point where the, uh, the city of New York prohibited new installations because they had drilled so many so many holes through so many floors that uh, they were worried about the structural integrity of the building. Again, it's a building code issue, but it's it's something I'm I'm hoping we can ask the new developers to consider because I think it makes their property more attractive for their tenants too. I like that right there. I really do. Having having to have, like I said, uh, had a lot of nightmares and uh, consternation. It just, it makes sense. I mean, if it's just like part of the detailed site plan, that if you're going to locate, say, a loading dock, then you make it a specific site requirement that this multi contraptions that you're talking about uh, are installed in the first place. They got to install them anyway. It's coming. Yeah. I mean. Makes perfect sense, John. Well, thank Perfect. you. I totally agree as well. Well, thank you. Please feel free to call on any of us. And if there's anything we can do to assist, uh, we'll be happy. We'll be happy to help. We're looking forward to a, uh, a fully connected, competitive uh, data environment, not just for the residents, but for the businesses in Bowie. Uh, like I say, there's some of the most heavy data users in the world are already out at Belford. I expect, I hope more will come. Yeah. Uh, and when we look at places like Sears and all these other multi-use properties, they're talking about uh, as people change from retail uh, in a car to retail by a, a computer, uh, there's a, there, there should be some opportunities for us to ask for imagination on the part of the developers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. John, I want to uh, thank you for the presentation. I think it's uh, definitely value add to the effort that, you know, we undertake when we have the developers come in before us. And uh, we're all looking for uh, opportunities to inject smart growth, um, smart growth decisions into designs as they're, um, you know, as they come before us. So uh, I think that we will be, uh, more aware now of some of these concerns 
after hearing your presentation. So I look forward to uh, you know more engagement with you in the future. And I want to again thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for allowing me to come in. Okay, very good. Thanks. Okay, hey, um, Joe, we have some minutes to approve. Yes, you have the minutes of December 15th, 2020, and the minutes of April 27th, 2021. Okay, so you all have those minutes, and um, I'll take a motion on the first set of minutes, which was December, you said? December 15th. December 15th, so. So moved. Okay, minutes for December 20th, a motion for approval by Mr. Scotes. Do we have a second? Second. All right, second by Mr. Berg. Questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, minutes approved. And the next minutes are? April 27th. I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the minutes to the April 27th meeting. I wasn't here. A motion, please. Yeah, I, uh, I, make, uh, I make a motion to approve the April 27th minutes. Okay, motion to approve by Lisa, second. I'll second it. Second by Mr. Scopes. Um, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, the minutes are hereby approved. All right. And um, any other business on the agenda? No, sir. Okay. Well, I just, uh, I just have, I have one, I'm sorry, I have one comment, please. It's Mike Bird. So, so hey, Joe, I mean, that was a very great, great presentation by Mr. John. Um, and I know we had a planning design guideline review a few months back, but how would we implement, say for us at the municipality level, how would we implement a guideline or how would we implement a um, consideration or condition within our planning guidelines to maybe pose to some of the developers as they're coming in? Well, the IT committee was a participant in the updating of the guidelines. And so the council agreed to accept the language that was discussed tonight as part of those guidelines. And so they're already in there for you to use when a developer comes before you. And I think what Mr. Eidness was suggesting was at a minimum, you should ask the questions of the developers and their architects, you know, when they bring their whole team, it's just a matter of getting that question out there to see how they respond to it or maybe you'll provide some guidance to them you know as as they as they continue to refine their project and and they may take that to heart and and actually address those things the city uh, doesn't have the ability to do a lot of regulation so in some cases where we might have a covenant on a property you know that's legally enforceable by the city but those are pretty rare and okay. it's not a historic district in the cities like Annapolis, where you can actually regulate through the design through your architectural review. So I think at, at a minimum, you can ask the question, be aware of these needs and these issues, and just try to bring it to people's attention. I think that's what they're really asking you to do. Copy, thank you, sir. Okay, um, being that there's no other official business on the agenda, uh, I want to take this opportunity to um, thank Mr. Frank Stevens yeah. for his, uh, gosh, many years of service. Frank has been here as long as I've been on the board, and that's been many, many years. And mm -hmm. um, just like a, uh, he's a fixture. <laughs> <laughs> he's a fixture. <laughs> uh, Frank, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, we see our fixtures and we they tend to just kind of blend in and um, you know, forget they're there. They're such you know uh, a prominent part of uh, you know what you do every day. But I want to uh, let you know that uh, you have been recognized. You have not blended into the background. So, <laughs> I tried to. <laughs> you tried to, but Frank, you know, the work that you do is just you know it speaks for itself. And you have been an outstanding, outstanding uh, city planner for us and. Uh, 
Um, I wish you the best, you know, nothing but the best as you move forward in the next phase of your life. And I uh, hope you don't forget about us. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. Well, thank you very much for yeah, your yeah. words, Terry. Yeah, and if yeah, anyone yeah. else wants to join in, you know, give Frank, you know, some words, please feel free. Yes, uh, Frank, just thanks for all the work that you've done for the city. It has been a pleasure working with you and congratulations on your retirement. Thank you, Lisa. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, listen, guys, uh, Frank, so we'll see you next Monday night, correct? That'll be your last official duty before um, the council? Um, no, I won't be at council on Monday. Say I it again? I won't be at council on Monday. So you're, you're, you're officially done then? I believe so, with the <laughs> meetings, unless something pops up, but I think well, this listen. is it. Job well done, Frank. Cheers. <laughs> Good job. Big ups. Big ups, Mr. Stevens. Big ups. Big ups. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys take care. Thanks for your time. And uh, Frank, we hope to see you again soon. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thanks, right. Frank. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night. Going to do a motion to adjourn. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can we have a motion uh, for adjournment? Mr. Chair, I move that we adjourn at 2001 minute. <laughs> Mr. Scott, you said so moved, right? So moved. I said, yeah, is that eight o'clock, sir? That's, right. that's, it's now 802 <laughs> to be exact, Mr. 8 Scoot. PM, 8, sir, 802. Right? 2002, sir. <laughs> All right. Um, motion to adjourn has been approved. Thank you, guys. Everybody have a good one. Take All care. Right. Take care, folks. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.